Welcome to um, Gertrude Glasshouse, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here today and um, like to um, acknowledge that we gather here on Wurundjeri land and pay my respects to elders past, pre present and emerging. And it is, um, it is a great occasion to be here with Michaela Dwyer um, on the final stages of her um, O to the OO exhibition, which was um, set to open at the start of the most recent lockdown. And so we're really thrilled to um, be at this stage now and to um, have you all he gather here with us uh, to both see the exhibition and to um, hear some of Michaela's um, off the cuff <laughs> reflections on the project and her um, practice and working methodology. Um, <clears throat> um, so I'll, I'll just um, start by saying that um, I've been um, an enormous fan of Michaela's work for uh, many, many years. And I, Oops, I, remember, <clears throat> I remember before I worked in Sydney from 2010 that, um, you know, for that decade prior, there were probably, this has been contentious, so, um, uh, but there were only two artists that Melbourne, a younger generation of Melbourne artists had, um, had knowledge of and a great <laughs> appreciation for in, 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 in Melbourne at that time. And if, um, and that was Hany Armenius and Michaela Dwyer. So it's oh, wow. been, um, this, that's true, actually. Oh, that's you could ask many, um, many younger artists from that time. And, and that was, um, you know, I guess in some ways kind of spoke to um, um, your practice very specifically, but also the way that it resonated with um, Melbourne artists. So it was um, thrilling to have you moved down to Melbourne in, in, in recent years to take up a um, associate professorship at RMIT. Mm -hmm. So um, a great um, a great thing for for Melbourne and um, and um, great thing for us. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> so. Um, this exhibition, and I'll, I'll speak a little bit as we kind of evolve this about the way you work, but it's, it's been so interesting to watch it as a, um, as, a, as a kind of a process, as a kind of responsive process. Um, but maybe before we get into um, thinking about the way you worked in the responding to the site from within the space, um, thinking about your... Um, collaboration with the composer around your first thoughts of, um, of uh, in some ways, you know, I think of it as the, um, the O to the OO. So for those who don't um, um, know, the, the OO bird was a, and, and we're kind of jumping on any of this now, but it was a, um, a bird that was, um, if not native to, then, then certainly um, um, prevalent in Hawaii and, mm with the last um, sighting of one of the OO birds being in the mid-80s in Hawaii. Yeah, I think that's when it became yeah. extinct, yeah. So in some ways, you know, I think when we were speaking about the show, um, as you were working with um, the composer around it, um, you know, I was kind of struck by the, um, you know, in some ways the kind of the sadness of that as, as a starting point to think about um, you know, the call of a bird to a potential mate and for that... No reply. Not, yeah, for that, <laughs> that reply never to emerge and then for that to um, lead to a really, you know, forlorn final existence for the bird. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess it, it, it started around that thinking of this YouTube video I watched. I was... Um, sort of doing these night classes and I was talking, I was, sort of, I was actually in a Mark Dion class at, in the middle of the night for this alternative art school that I'd been attending and we were sort of paired off into <coughs> these um, collaborations and I started collaborating with this young woman from America, no idea where, but and we just both sort of clicked on this thing and I think she showed me the initial video of this um, the O.O. Bird's last call, which if you just Google it on 
and you'll come up with it and it's just so devastatingly sad, this last plaintive call to a bird that never replies. So it's the end, it's the kind of end of this species of bird. And so we started cooking up this idea about a supernatural zoo, which you know we might develop later, but then I, you know, for this show, I thought it was a great opportunity to collaborate with my dear friend James Hayes over here, who is a wonderful composer, musician, and DJ. And I think you know sometimes shows are a really good excuse to um, collaborate with good people. And um, and we just started cooking up this sound thing and thinking about birds in general, future like future extinctions. Thinking about this past extinction, but then thinking about kind of pre-extincting. So these birds that play in here are there's a bellbird, there's a magpie, there's a oo bird, and they're quite abstracted to the edge of recognition so it's sort of becoming and it's just in a state of disappearing and becoming it's just you know that these bird sounds but there's also the sound of um, big bird who's also extinct um, Carol Spinney I've forgotten what year he died it was a while back but you know the famous big bird um, so we had a, so we have a kind of human in bird drag in several instances <laughs> along with the one in the video. And um, I guess, yeah, it was this sort of sadness, I guess, was the impetus. But also just to work in this space, I think it came, and also lockdown happened, and it became very improvisory because I couldn't work this stuff out in the studio for a number of reasons. You know, we had lockdown and whatnot. And I find things, you know, I need to think through making and moving stuff about and I'm not very good at just planning things in my head and then they pop out and they look the same as what they are in my head. I don't think that happens for anyone much actually, but... So, am I going off track? Here? No, but I mean, that actually, <laughs> so, that actually I, segues into how I was you know, how I think about your work where it really feels, and I think this is the great um, attraction of your work intergenerationally, this idea that it it feels and looks like this real um, transition from the studio to the exhibition space. Like it has a kind of a, um, you know, a real liveness when we think about, um, you know, artists who have been, um, you know, practicing for 30, 40 years, you know, they quite often get into, they find the formula that kind of clicks and that um, still looking. has, has <laughs> well, it, you know, has, it may have appeal, may have, um, you know, may have broad public appeal, but may have um, commercial appeal for a while. And then I feel that ours sometimes get stuck in that rut and can't kind yeah. of, um, you know, transition out of it. So, you know, I think while it, it um, you know, it kind of, every work kind of reminds one of, of the history of those works rather than thinking about a way forward. And I think this is the really interesting thing about your practice and the way that you work is that it always, um, and, and you know, I think the arts is quite tragic in some ways about that, it, the way that it speaks about experimentation and risk. Whereas, mm. you know, I, I really feel that your practice does take those risks and, and to give you a kind of an example of this um, or you know about testing things out and using the kind of exhibition space to test things out. I have to tell you an anecdote from Claire Lamb because <laughs> we were like well this on the notion of risk and um, I was in the middle of this and I was re I have to say this was a real struggle this show I, I really couldn't quite get it happening it was a total disaster till about an hour before it opened, before it opened to the public, because I just, I, I don't know, it just wasn't working then. And I said to Claire, you know, what, you know, it's just a, you know, it's a disaster, it's terrible, I, you know, and she's going, look, Carl, there's just two ways to do it. You either go like I have and go and bury your head for two years and work your shit out by yourself in private, or you go and humiliate yourself in public and work it out in public. Mm. I thought, yeah, that's what I always do. I just <laughs> humiliate myself in public. But um, I don't, yeah, I think it's just 
different ways of losing money. Yeah. But I risk, mean this risk is really is not fun. <laughs> no, but I mean, I think that's what makes it so, um, you know, dynamic as a practice that it, it is, it is kind of responsive to the situation and it's responsive to the space. And so I think in those instances where you're not, um, you know, necessarily familiar with a space, and, you know, I think this architecture is, is very, um, you know, it's very omnipresent within the space that a, oh, a lot yeah. of things can't be kind of worked through. And, Until you know, I think here, if you're yeah. a painter, of course, you know, the painter yeah. has, a, has a, a degree of, um, you know, autonomy to, yeah, yeah. To, to a degree. But I think, you know, any installational practice that revolves around the kind of relationships of, of things and sound within a space mm. is so experiential. And I think... That yeah, was the thing I think James and I couldn't work out how the sound would work in the space because, you know, you can't really test it till you no. put it in here. But yeah. And, the, yeah, and the architecture is really strong, mm. and, you know, so I, I really enjoy working with architecture and a lot of my practice has always somehow been around architecture and architectural theory and, and trying to sort of mess with it somehow. So it, it, this was such a nice, strong challenge in a way to mm. kind of play with. But it was getting the better of me <laughs> for a lot of it. Yeah, but I <laughs> Until think... Until the end, I when, think. I mean, when we first started speaking about it, it was in the initial, um, you know, maybe in the initial period of its gestation, was just going to be a sound composition within the space, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like it, it... And, you know, we did sort of talk about this this thing of actually if you this is where I think um, things flipped was James and I were talking about could could the space just carry the sound with nothing else because if we're talking about loss or extinction or you know maybe and I really wanted to create a sense of that loss for the viewer but um, Mark was kind of questioning whether that could hold the space. It, and it was kind of a, this thing where it got to a point where it was actually working. It was really sad, but really absent, really like there was nothing to look at, really. Mm. And it was sort of doing what it should be doing. But I thought it's, um, it's kind of the problem where it, it needed more. It needed to be, have a, you know, a generosity to to, I don't know, it's how I, had, I had this word in my head before, but it, it, it was something that um, the sound was doing its thing and it, the sound is incredibly sculptural too and, it, you know, it, it does take up the space, but there's also, I can't really put my finger on it, but it, there was something that um, it, yeah, needed, I guess, some form of hope. <laughs> Mm. I don't know. I don't know if it was that hope or sort of. Um, I'm not explaining this at all well. It's kind of like a parallel hope and hopelessness somehow. That um, I don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> Just, uh, but um, I mean, this, you know, for me, watching it evolve in the space as yeah. you know, when, when, and we we had discussions around what form, loose form, it could take, and and I I. I Obviously, I suggested that I thought it could be, you know, further animated by some kind of visual yeah. sense to kind of, um, you know, kind of hold you within the space. Because I think, um, you know, the acoustic soundtrack is so um, hypnotic that in some ways you kind of need in that, um, you know, in a sort of a slight state of bliss you need something to kind of focus on to um yeah it, yeah there was something for, that you know, it, and, and for some way a visual element for the acoustic mm. element to um resonate so strongly i guess it was a testament to the power of art actually like that that loss has to kind of flip into its other at some point it sits on this i think artists always work in this state of loss like making present what is absent you know, mm. in whatever part of their life or in the world or they, they materialise things out mm. of nothing or, you know, art is about some kind of, um, you know, it's creation, isn't it? It's something. It's um, that the loss has to 
transform into something. It has to be in a state of transformation yeah. at least or something. So I think um, I was trying to literally create the loss and the loss it was just it, like a big black hole was just sucking everything up. So then I started introducing objects and things and nothing worked for a while. Mm. I think it wasn't until the graffiti happened out on the glass that I suddenly... Um, there's something about the mark of a graffiti artist. There's something about this mark as a gesture of like I'm here in, yeah. in whatever circumstance in the street or that I sort of, I thought it was a really, and I tried to sort of bring, bring it in here. And um, in a sense, it became also this mark, I'm here. Mm. You know, and, and again, this thing, I'm here that we're going. <laughs> you know, this, te this sort of temporariness of, um, you know, there's finger marks or this big bird that's dying or mm. these birds that are not extinct yet, but all this state of flux of things across time. Yeah. Dying. <laughs> um, to, give, to give you um, some context, so every time that um, Gertrude and Glass Arts have needed to close during the lockdown, that, um, or specifically here actually, um, every time we've been closed for a, a lockdown, no matter how short, that we've... We've, um, on every occasion, we've had something, um, some graffiti or something happen to that window outside. And I think that sort of, in some ways, kind of speaks to this idea of this, um, you know, kind of the absence of people and what kind of um, seems to happen when, when, you know, even in that yeah. lockdown, which was a couple of weeks. And so when um, we were allowed to kind of come back into the space um, and that um, the blue tag was on the window and and talking to Michaela about it and actually I think I came in when you weren't here and noticed that there were um this kind of tape Bandage. marks across <laughs> and, I, I, and I kind of already kind of very quickly um clued in that this was something that you were kind of reclaiming somebody's I somebody honestly, else's it reclamation. It wasn't my graffiti, honest. I didn't do it. And then from that, <laughs> then sitting, standing outside and we were talking about, you know, whether we should, because at that stage we'd already put the exhibition signage up behind it. So it was almost like you were looking through this tag to um, the title of Michaela's show. But um, Michaela was very, um, so enamored by the, 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 um, the um, you know, the colour of the blue and the kind of, um, luminosity of seeing her um, name pronounced through it that um but also the confidence of it the mark making out there is really if it's a, it really is a work it's just it's so beautifully done so in some ways that gesture had been um was the kind of activator of um of the, the final stage of this yeah which is kind of like a big bird shit against glass or <laughs> acrylic there's actually, there is bird shit in there. <laughs> so it is kind of this melding point, melting point between, um, you know, barriers and, um, I don't know. Um, <laughs> a, a variant coronavirus. <laughs> um, so what, what is your, like, what, are, what are your thoughts on zoos? Well, it did start off thinking about a zoo with yeah. this. I started thinking about this as a supernatural zoo. Mm. So like these absent um, creatures animated back or, you know, summons back into some kind of being with the help of James into these presences. So mm. like, uh, uh, yeah, zoos are incredibly sad places. Yeah. And I guess, um, you know, there's a fantastic, but, you know, amazing why look at animals book john berger book mm. why look at animals that one it's like about the animals looking back at us but i know zoos are i yeah i find this sort of architecture of zoos kind of interesting i guess like and i so this i was sort of began the process thinking about the grid as a way of a kind of a logic that is a bit like, um, you know, a very uh, abstracted version of a zoo. It's an ordering system. It's a spatially kind of um, organising system. And, and a zoo is also, comes out of that 
organising and, you know, animals into taxonomy so that we can look at them and understand mm. the world beyond a certain, you know, um, species beyond where you live. Yeah. So. I mean, I guess that's the double-edged sword of them, that they are, um, you know, as you say, they're kind of inherently sad because you see these animals absolutely decontextualised and... And pacing and, and anxious and lonely stressed. And, and going through all kinds yeah, yeah. of, um, you know, What's environmental it? trauma. Yeah. But like, then at the same time, they're the things that we... They're kind of our only opportunities to see these animals and to build up a kind of a broader sense of empathy for them. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's really... It's interesting, like, just, you know, animals in the city too, just... Like, it's kind of our only... Um, you know, after lockdown, I think everybody became very connected to birds, mm. bird life, because you could hear them. Like, suddenly you could hear them because all the cars had quietened down and I think everybody had a, a different awareness of them. So that, I think, started all this off in a way. But um, Simultaneously, though, you'd been also working on some, um, you know, I guess you could say quite ephemeral public art projects involving oh, yeah, the possums. possums. And <laughs> oh yeah, there's more extinctions isn't there, I forget. Like there's a, yeah, some possums and some koalas. Yeah. In projections and that they they're quite different to this in that they're just um, single projections or one's a double projection in a park into a tree which are built up from it's an animation of a possum that looks incredibly realistic like a possum, but it's actually a really deep fake possum and a deep fake koala. And it's completely built out of geometry. And then, you know, with the help of Gina Moore, who's an amazing animator, and then just building it up into this. And she's a kind of got this uncanny ability to breathe life into these um, cool animations. And then, so again, they're sort of looking at, I guess, you know, future loss and apparitions and the way ghosts kind of are these things that bring messages back from all, you know, are like messages from the future or the past in, again, I guess like extinctions are yeah. kind of a, an apparition of, um, and we've had so many, I guess, over all the time we've been on this earth that I guess it's about thinking, you know, deep time, is um, something, like we can get very sentimental about birds and possums and koalas, but then think about all the species that have kind of gone and all the new ones that are viruses mm. <laughs> to come, you know, like it is interesting new um, life forms to come. So, yeah, where are we going? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I think, you know, this... this <laughs> Sorry. This, um, focus on animals is quite an interesting extension. You know, I think there's a, a, always been a really um, spiritual impact in your work, even in the sculptural works and this kind mm. of, um, you know, almost, uh, you know, thinking about occult symbology and, um, and about this idea of, um, you know, maybe connecting to things otherworldly and, and maybe the, uh, this recent focus on um, the oo bird and, and um, possums and koalas is another way of, of what well, particularly maybe with the oo bird is about this kind of um, yearning to kind of speak back to yeah. them or to hear that yeah. voice or that kind of almost like a um, that an affirmation that they're not past in a way yeah or that Yeah, or what is it to pass away? What is it to, what, you know, these sort of weird molecular changes of, you know, entropy or dying or extinctions and, um, and hauntings, I guess, mm. what haunts us. Um, but how do, you, how do we learn from that, I guess? I mean, there's many cultures that really take those hauntings seriously and those messages from the dead become ways to inform how you live. Yeah. So 
um, yeah, so it's not, it's not as sort of sad as it sounds. Mm. I think it's just more some sort of um, a kind of density of um, dimension somehow. Yeah, and I guess that um, desire for connectivity in a way. Yeah, and you know. And transition deep through time, life cycles and so on. Deep ways. listening, all those kind of um, mm. things that we're so bad at um, trying to get better at. Yeah, I think it's just, it, it, you know, hauntings and ghost stories and things are very rich kind of um, cultural tools to sort of stretch the imagination into spaces that it doesn't normally inhabit. In a way. I mean, maybe that's also an interesting way to think about your, um, you know, you've made lots of sculptural works, but you've, they are quite informed by the space and exist for a period of time, so they are in some ways quite ephemeral yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk a bit about um, the idea of kind of creating these environments knowing that they too will pass and they kind of uh, maybe <laughs> in relation to the idea of um, not to make it sound so spooky but the, um, you know, the haunting of the gesture once it's disappeared? Like um, well, what it, what it is, yeah, so what it is to sort of build, um, to spend so much time thinking around um, the creation of an environment, knowing that post-exhibition that um, that environment will no longer exist and even the things, the components of that environment won't mm. really exist. Um, well, yeah, I'm really big on recycling. <laughs> so, yep. so things just, um, they might, yeah, it's kind of gone, but then it will pop up in the next show. <laughs> Cause mm. Usually because storage issues. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so I find that there's a way to kind of, that these things will live on and on, like a um, reincarnate in, yep. in other, uh, other ways. I mean, I was going to chuck that, but then I kind of got <laughs> really interested in what was, where that, a sort of new direction that was taking me in. So I was like, I'm not ready to chuck it, so it's going to Roslyn's. <laughs> Great. And so I'm going to try and test that out in another situation. But, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. I, it's, I guess it's not about so much... Um, it's about, like, for me, I'm more and more interested in how we can... Um, each show can be this sort of opportunity to create a, a community of things, whether it is a community of objects or relations or build new situations that you can invite people into, like a sort of hosting organism. Yep. So like Kay over there and I are working on a piece for Rosalind, where she's just, you know, made these fantastic pyjamas mm. that we're going to dress up Rosalind Oxley and the staff oh, that's for great. a pyjama party. <laughs> But then COVID's happened, so we don't know quite when that's going to happen. Maybe it'll be a closing, but so just be, and this is what was, has been really great about being a studio artist at Gertrude, um, is that you're all, you know, you, you're sort of around all these artists and these incidental conversations and becoming aware slowly of people's practices and things and that. And also my friend James, it, you know, like there's just this way, instead of like worrying about where's the work going to go after this, you know, there's, the work is, you know, it's, it's ongoing in terms of the, the community of things that it, and networks and things that come out of it. Yeah. So that that, that is generative. It's, it's you know, yeah. continually building and ebbing and flowing and to me is the most interesting part of it. These are kind of props for, for those things to happen. Yeah, like for the relationships in some ways yeah. to form. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, for me, I think something that I've seen in your practice for such a long time that it is so um, generously communal that you bring people into it, but it is also... It's really hard though too. Cause, yeah. Because you all, it's communal and also sometimes you're colonising 
you know, there's a yeah. fine line sometimes. Yeah. You've got to watch out when you're colonising other people. Like, you know, I could be... But I don't know. That's yeah, just but something I, I, I... mean, I, you know, it's watching you work, I, I always feel... You know, because I've seen it from different kinds of ways with different kinds of artists. And, and some artists will talk about, um, you know, that all these works are made in collaboration with all these people, but the collaborators are never acknowledged. And, you know, the authorship is on the um, instruction of of that person as an author. So it's yeah. almost like it, it Im embeds a kind of, um, you know, a labor force without acknowledgement. But I feel when I've seen you work that there is something, you know, a actually quite naturally generative and, um, and you know, maybe kind of um, given sculptural direction mm. by you, but it is something that other people um, seem to and go away with the feeling of um, contributing yeah. to, which I think is what makes um, somebody like you such an exciting um, educator as well within a university context. Oh, I think which it's... I, you know, which I saw at, at SCA from people who yeah. had studied with you, that there was kind of an excitement about the way that, not only the way that you work, but the way that you... Um, you uh, help artists to think about these questions of working together, but also to think about, um, and this is, I think, is one of the, as I mentioned before, one of the really exciting aspects of your practice, the kind of the, you know, the provisional and the using the kind of um, materials that are at hand rather than it being kind of overly prescribed and being by its nature kind of very experimental and experimental in its, um, not only in its materiality, but in its um, communality of working together. Yeah, I mean, I think that's very nice of you to say all that, but I think it's also this thing of um, becoming confident with not knowing, so that yeah. that you um, that the experiment is always a state of not knowing, and mm. that you um, you can't get too stable and too rigid in that kind of space and the, and, the, and the thing with sharing with other people it's also this um, it makes the work much more interesting if you're if you're open to that infection you yeah know? so it's like um, the work I, you know I can't get too stuck in my own aesthetic habits if I've in, and I'm much more interested to see my aesthetic I mean I have very strong formal mm. tendencies and stuff that I've been trying to get rid of all my life you know I've inherited from it you know, a Danish mother that was very clear about what good design was, mm. you know, and I've had to try and shake that off, you know, as you do, you've got to kind of... But so to do that, you need to, you know, you invite other people in to kind of haunt you in a way, to, mm. be, to be possessed or to share or to be infected by other people. It just makes better, interesting work, I think. Yeah. It's great to you don't, use you infected don't. by other people in a positive <laughs> context. <laughs> and I think that does come out of a rebellion against good, pure yeah. Danish design because it is so um, defined and, the, you know, so formal and, the, you know, it's the contours and the edges are so, you know, sharp and determined and fixed and, and the purity is always this yeah. thing. So that, yeah, so sort of kind of a, a lifelong... Um, project really to a lifelong undoing uh, of good design mm. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> hence my reaction to the grid i think <laughs> yeah well and that was funny that when we were first talking about um um this acrylic piece and that you were really interested in responding to the grid and 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 you know f for me almost as a surprise when you first spoke about hanging it that you had actually gone with kind of um, a really kind of formal hang of it level and <laughs> with a grid structure on it and kind of, um, you know, facing against the, you know, facing out to the window. So it seemed in some ways kind of so, um, it seems so structured. And then yeah. watching you for d the days afterwards <laughs> of Agonizing. constantly looking at it and going, there's something, <laughs> something not really right wrong. about <laughs> it. and. Um, but, you know, and I think it was the kind of the response to the external environment and the kind of enmeshing of that blue within it and the kind of, um, you know, in some ways off-kiltering of it that made you feel much more um, enlivened by yeah, it, it as, a, as a process within the space. 
Yeah, as soon as we could make it crooked, yeah. it, everything felt better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know, actually. Um, are there any elements that you want to pick out and talk to sort of very specifically within it as a composition? Um, I don't know. Does anybody want to ask questions? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> what did I say to you? <laughs> James, James, can you do this? Can I think you? with the O bird and then we talked a lot about extinction. Yeah. And how you wanted to have a sort of digital feel to the music. Like it was sort of going to be things that might be extinct in the future and animals that are already extinct. So I kind of was yeah. like, okay, digital, so a lot of effects in that sort of Yeah. Feel. Less, like something that wasn't too bird-like, something that was a bit, yeah. Um, yeah, so we started just playing, bouncing sounds back and forth between each other and, um, but James is an incredibly attentive listener and like, you know, I didn't, we didn't actually have to, like it just sort of flowed like very, very intuitively. I think we, we worked it out quite quickly really and you were so generous with your time when you had like a lot of time to just to talk about it. And to listen, and just to listen to all James's fantastic sounds he was cooking up. There was a lot of editing. <laughs> <laughs> but it was also, you, you're just, your ability to, I think, um, understand, you know, the, what I was trying to do and, and, and then me being able to just trust you to kind of with your composition and the, your the way that you arrange and the way you hear things and compose things was just really it really opened something out. So, and then we you know we we're trying to work out how to just practically do four different tracks like without too much equipment, not laptops and mixing desks and things. And then we just came up with a very simple way that we could play four different tracks that could all like can be um, sort of interfered with a bit again by whoever's minding the show depending on the way they turn it on it's it's, it's never the same composition it's always slightly can all, it just changes so there's another level of infection or collaboration from the the minder which is nice does that answer that <laughs> yeah um, anyone have any questions? Well, um, if anybody does have questions for Michaela, she is going to be here celebrating. Um, Can I just the, say, do a few thanks? Yeah. I just want to thank um, Mark and Tracy and Tim and Ian for all their help setting things up, and to David and to James and. Um, to um, Michael Schwartz and David Clouston, who really generously give this space to, to artists to, to do crazy experiments in. <laughs> Incredibly generous and um, unusual art advocates in, in this country. Um, and yeah, and to thank my students and also my colleague over there, Nikos, <laughs> who, who actually came in and did a lot of um, good work on the, in helping me sort of, did a good tough quit on me on the, you know, trying to tell me what, what was what. And I do trust his kind of, um, his eye. <laughs> and um, yeah, and thanks to my students who are from art here. And yeah, and thank you to all of you for coming. Yeah. And thank you to Michaela. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.